said the research that we do in our laboratory is um, really looking at the sources of emotional development and the way that our emotions develop over time. And we also look at the role of underlying neurobiological changes that we see across the first two decades of life. So our research addresses a very old question in psychology, which is, how is it that experiences that we have early in life seem to be very important and have these enduring, long-lasting consequences on our behaviors that we see later on in adulthood? And um, you know, as you all can appreciate, humans live for a long time. They take a long time to grow up compared to other species. And so we want to understand what's the glue that's linking early experiences that we have with our adult functioning. And so the approach that we take is to study brain development. In particular, we're interested in how early experiences are influencing the way that our brain constructs itself over time that will ultimately lead to individual differences we see in emotional behaviors. And the emotion that uh, the emotional behavior that we're especially interested in is um, often called emotion regulation. That's the ability to kind of calm down our emotions when we have really big ones. And to study the neurobiology of emotion regulation, there are lots of um, neural regions that we can focus on, but perhaps the most, uh, the, the primary uh, circuitry that we should be focusing on is pictured here. So today I'm gonna to be talking about the amygdala, which as many of you are already familiar with, is this deep set of nuclei in the brain that help us with emotional attention, paying attention and being vigilant, um, as well as learning about what's safe and dangerous in the environment. And so for shorthand purposes, you can think of when we're feeling really emotional about things, we tend to see increases in amygdala reactivity. And conversely, when we're feeling regulated and calm, we tend to see decreases in amygdala reactivity. Now, in adulthood, the amygdala has a very special relationship with the prefrontal cortex. So this is the front of the brain here. This is the prefrontal cortex. In particular, the middle part of the prefrontal cortex called the medial prefrontal cortex. And um, you, there are strong connections, physiologic connections that you can think of as a bridge between the amygdala and prefrontal cortex. Now, the prefrontal cortex gets lots of information from different parts of the brain. It gets information from our perceptual areas, from our memory areas, language, and so on, so that it can provide much more sophisticated information to the amygdala that very much helps regulate that over arousal of the amygdala. So in adulthood, we find that there are these strong connections, this communication highway between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala that's associated with um, emotion regulation. Now, why do early experiences matter so much? One of the reasons it has to do with sensitive periods in brain development. And some of you may have come across this term before, but the idea is that sensitive periods are these moments early in life when a neural circuit is especially prone to be influenced by the environment. So it's especially plastic, so to speak. So the way you can think about it is if this is time running from left to right, we've got the basic central nervous system architecture set up early in life. And then we get this sensitive period opening. You can think of it as a window of opportunity when the environment has a really big impact on that neurobiology and the way that it's gonna develop. So that after that sensitive period window closes, our phenotypic expression or the, our behaviors and our brain reflect what happened during this sensitive period. And so if we look at a number of mental health problems that are associated with poor emotion regulation, we tend to see that they have their peak age of clinical onset in early adolescence, broadly speaking. 
And so if that's the age at which we start to see those individual differences emerging, and we're interested in identifying potential sensitive periods for those behaviors, then we're motivated to look at the antecedent period during childhood. We wanna know what's happening during childhood that might be contributing to these individual differences that we see in adolescents. So I wanna start off by sharing just some basic growth chart information about the amygdala. When we're born, the basic neuroanatomical architecture of the amygdala is already present. And within the first year of life, we see massive growth in amygdala size. So what I'm showing you here is the amygdala volume at birth. And then by your first birthday, you can see that there's 105% change in that volume. And then there's still some continued change, but it's really tiny. And the subsequent changes are dwarfed by what happens in this first year. So we already know that structurally, the human amygdala is undergoing most of its development in that first year after life. So my laboratory is interested not in those structural or volumetric changes, but it's interested in the functional changes or the changes in activity across the first two decades of life. So I'd like to share with you um, one of our earlier studies that asked a very simple question. We brought in healthy, typically developing individuals between the ages of four and 22 years old. And we presented them with stimuli that we knew were really good at activating the amygdala. And that is a fear face. As primates, when somebody makes a fearful face, it captures our attention and it's a really good way to activate our amygdalas. So we presented these fear faces to participants from early childhood to adulthood, and we measured their amygdalas responses to those images to see whether there were age-related changes in reactivity or function. And for those of you who have ever seen how we collect these data, I'm showing you here a movie of a child in a pretend MRI machine. I'm going to silence that if I can. Okay. Um, so in an MRI, uh, participants lie down in a bore and um, she's wearing goggles here and um, we can take pictures of her brain as she's looking at different things. She happens to be laughing right now because we're just getting started and she's watching SpongeBob SquarePants. So we want her to feel relaxed and comfortable. And then after a while, we'll shut off SpongeBob and then we'll present these fear faces to her to watch how her brain responds. So we do that in all of our participants from four to 22 years old. And what we find is the amygdala shows a big age-related change in response to these fear faces. And I'm gonna pull out these data here so you can see it better. This is age on the x-axis in years and amygdala response on the y-axis. And each dot is a participant in the study. And what you can see right away is at younger ages, we get a really strong amygdala response that tends to decrease as we get older. And this was interesting because often we think about brain function as increasing as we get older, but instead we're finding that the strongest responses are occurring in the four and five-year-olds. And that makes a good bit of sense to us when we think about what the amygdala's main job is, which is to learn about the safety and danger of the environment. So when you're little, and you're relatively new to this planet, you have a lot more learning to do about what's safe and dangerous in the environment. So you want the amygdala chugging at full steam at a young age. So we can also use these data to measure that bridge or that connection, the strength of the connection between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. So I will describe. First, we know that um, from many, many, many studies that the prefrontal cortex develops late. And I'm showing you here, I'll press play in a minute. This is a movie um, showing changes in brain development 
across um, individuals from uh, four until 24 years old. And what you should pay attention to, this is the front of the brain, this is the back of the brain. What you should pay attention to is blue colors here means getting more mature. So I want you to pay attention to what part of the brain is taking the longest to mature, is taking the longest to turn blue. And what you can see is that the prefrontal cortex is one of the last regions to turn blue. In fact, we don't see adult-like levels in the prefrontal cortex. This is a structural measure in prefrontal cortex structure until the early 20s. So it takes a long time to grow up our prefrontal cortex. So using that knowledge, we wanted to ask about, well, how long does it take the connections between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala to hook up in an adult-like way? So using the data that I showed you in response to fear faces, we pulled out the time course of activity from one region like the amygdala, and we plot it over time. And then we pull out the activity from the prefrontal cortex and plot it over time. Now, the degree to which these two lines are correlated with each other gives us an index of what's called functional connectivity. So in other words, the more correlated or more similar these two time courses are, we say that these two regions are having a conversation with each other. Now, when it comes to the amygdala and prefrontal cortex, what people usually find doesn't look like this. Instead, it looks like this. When one region like the prefrontal cortex increases its activity, the other region, the amygdala correspondingly decreases its activity. So that's consistent with a top-down control, a prefrontal cortex control of the amygdala. So when we're feeling emotionally regulated, our prefrontal cortex increases its activity and our amygdala decreases its activity. That's what emotion regulation looks like in the brain in healthy adults. So in other words, this would represent a negative correlation between amygdala and prefrontal cortex. And that negative correlation is associated with better emotion regulation in adulthood. Okay, so now the question is, I just told you what it looks like in adults. The question is, what does this look like across development? So we repeated that functional connectivity measure I just described between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, and we find some big age-related changes. And it looks like this. In, these are young adults, in young adults, we replicate what I just described to you. We see that negative correlation or that regulated pattern in adults. In younger teens and older teens, I think this is about the age of a lot of you right now, we still see a negative correlation, but you can see that the magnitude is significantly smaller than it is in adulthood. So that's consistent with what we know about the slow development of emotion regulation skills, that they're continuing to get better throughout adolescence. What caught our attention most is what we observed in children. These are four to nine-year-old children. They did not show this negative correlation pattern. They showed a very different pattern altogether. Young children were showing a pattern that looked like a non-regulatory pattern. And we know, you know, if you think about it, a young child's ability to calm him or herself down is a lot more difficult than it is for you or for an adult. So we think that this pattern of activity between amygdala and prefrontal cortex is at least partly responsible for that developmental change. And uh, sorry, let me just say this. So in cartoon format, what we're seeing is in adults, when the prefrontal cortex gets hot, when it's increasing its activity, the amygdala decreases its activity. In children, we're not seeing that. When the, when the prefrontal cortex increases its activity, so does the amygdala. 
that's a not regulatory relationship. So putting these things together, what we're seeing is if this is age on the x-axis, during childhood, we get a really strong amygdala response to stimuli in the environment, but that's happening without the adult-like connections between amygdala and prefrontal cortex. We don't get these connections emerging until adolescence. So in childhood, we've got, sorry, we've got a very different, the nature of the neurobiology just looks different in childhood. Moreover, this shift in the brain from childhood to adolescence also statistically explains big maturations in emotional behavior. Young children tend to be more reactive, more scared about things in the environment. Think about the things you were scared of when you were little, right? Being apart from your parent, scared of clowns, under the bed, the dark, witches, and so on. And now you may still be scared of some things, but much few, many fewer things than when you were little. And that change is statistically explained by this change in the, in the brain. So this pattern made us really interested in childhood. What's going on in the environment that might influence this, mature, this immature neurobiology in a very special way, in a way that's different than if the environment were experienced later on. So um, many of you may be familiar with this quote. What we're seeing here is um, reminding us of a 200 year old quote by Wordsworth that the child is the father of the man. So that is to say that if we just take an adult vantage point of the brain, what you'll often hear is the prefrontal cortex is controlling the amygdala. But it may be that from a developmental vantage point, we can appreciate that the amygdala may be, since it's there earlier, may be tutoring or driving a lot of the way that the prefrontal cortex develop, a development ensues. So um, I think for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip this slide. Um, so what I've showed you is uh, called stimulus elicited connectivity. The measure of the connectivity strength in response to a stimulus like a fear face. But we can also measure what's called resting state connectivity using the same connectivity measure that I just described to you, but measuring that connectivity when people are doing nothing except, except staring at a cross on the screen. Now, the reason that people are interested in this measure is because when you measure brain connectivity, when you're not doing any particular task, what you get is essentially a functional skeleton of the brain. You get a sense of who in the brain is hanging out with whom when you're not doing any particular task. And that functional skeleton ends up being very predictive of individual differences in mental health in adulthood. So um, we're very interested in understanding how our brains are operating when we're not doing any particular job. And when we use that resting state connectivity measure, what we see is, let me start here on the right with adults, there's strong connections between the amygdala and that medial prefrontal cortex. But if we look in children, we don't see that same connectivity pattern. You can see the orange blob is missing here in children. So that's indicative of a very slow maturation of the connections between amygdala and medial prefrontal cortex. So we collected um, both the stimulus elicited connectivity and the resting state connectivity in all of our participants. And this allowed us to more formally ask the question whether con connectivity at one age is predicting what connectivity is gonna look like later on um, two years later. So we collected both types of connectivity at time one, and then everybody went home and grew up for two years and then came back and provided the same two connectivity measures. 
And what we found was, remember I said that resting state connectivity is really important because it's associated with individual differences in mental health outcomes. What we found was the best predictor of that resting state connectivity was not the previous resting state connectivity, but the previous stimulus elicited connectivity. So what does that mean? That means that the nature, the way that amygdala and prefrontal cortex are co-activating in response to things that happen to us in the environment is the best predictor of this future resting state connectivity, the best predictor of how the system is going to settle in the future. So I'm gonna skip that for now. The reason why, or one of the reasons why we care about this is because another branch of our lab studies um, the effects of early life stress and in particular early maltreatment. So um, here's an example of a uh, stressful environment for an infant. This is institutional caregiving, what we often call orphanages. And um, this is a very stressful environment for an infant because there are no parents. And um, there are many, many babies that any one particular uh, nurse, for example, has to take care of. And so we've been able to follow development after this type of early experience. And what we found is um, this early stress is associated with a greater risk for struggles in mental health and we get evidence of amygdala hyperactivity in children who've had this type of early experience. And we see evidence of atypical connectivity between the amygdala and prefrontal cortex. In other words, we're seeing that some of the behavioral difficulties that individuals can experience who experience early life stress can uh, correlate with these differences we see at the level of the amygdala and prefrontal cortex. Okay, so um, we have uh, been very motivated to think more carefully about what are the early experiences that we have that are um, influencing this neurobiology. And we've been motivated in our lab, we work with humans, but we're very motivated by the basic neuroscientific research in rodents. And a lot of this research has shown that things that we're exposed to or things that we learn about early in life can actually be used later on in maturity, often to reduce our distress, to reduce our anxiety. So I'm gonna walk you through an example to better um, illustrate what I'm talking about. And this is a rodent study from a colleague at Harvard named Takao Hench, who's a physiologist. And what he did is he placed adult mice in a big box, it's an open field. And what happens when you place uh, mice in an open field is they will run to the corners because it's very vulnerable for them in the center of the, the box. And in this experiment, he had one corner have a nest that was silent and one nest that played music. Now the average naive adult mouse will overwhelmingly prefer the silent nest unless during their childhood, they were pre-exposed to music, in which case in adulthood, they will now prefer the music nest. So this preference for the music nest depends on the developmental age at which they were exposed. It had to happen in that sensitive period window. And their preference was specific to song type. So if in childhood they were pre-exposed to Beethoven Symphony Number no. 1, then in adulthood they prefer Beethoven Symphony Number no. 1 and not jazz, and vice versa if they were exposed to jazz during development. So they have this preference for music. And what they find in adulthood is if you play them their childhood music, then in adulthood, it will reduce the mouse's anxiety. And um, what I'm showing you here are called CFOS data. They're um, each green dot here is a cell in the prefrontal cortex that's activating. When adult mice hear the songs from their childhood, 
you get increased activity in prefrontal cortex, but you do not get increased prefrontal cortex activity for songs that they heard at other moments in development. So we were very interested in this study because um, we're interested in finding human sensitive periods for this neurobiology. But that's very hard to do in humans because humans take a long time to grow up, right? So it's not like we could expose a child to some music and then let them grow up for 20 years and then test to see if that music reduces their anxiety. But maybe music gives us a vehicle to ask this question retrospectively. Maybe we can use um, not classical music or jazz, but maybe we can use pop music and we can use data from the billboard charts to know how old adults must have been when they were listening to certain songs a lot. So that hopefully we can be hitting that sweet spot, what we think is that sensitive period, that learning zone and not hitting other periods of development. So to walk you through what I'm talking about, imagine in the year 2012, that's when we designed the study, we brought in young adults, 22 year olds, and we want a stimulus from their childhood that they really only listened to in childhood and they didn't listen to a lot at other points in development. So we want a stimulus from around age seven when they were seven years old. So we do the math. And so we want a stimulus from 1997. So we searched through the archives and we found a stimulus that we can use. And so I don't even know if you guys know who these people are. Maybe you're too young, but you know who the back, everyone knows who the Backstreet Boys are. So we use the Backstreet Boys as a music stimulus to test this sensitive period question. So let me walk you through what we did. So just like in the mouse study, we first wanted to stress out our adult participants. We're not gonna put them in an open box. That doesn't make sense for humans. We wanna stress them out in a human relevant way. So we brought them into the lab and these were students at UCLA and we had them do hard SAT math. And we stood over their shoulders and watched them time them. And we told them that they were doing okay, but a little bit worse than the average UCLA student. So they should try and go a little bit faster and be a little bit more accurate. So this is very stressful for students, as you guys know. And then once they were stressed, we gave them breaks. And during those break periods, we presented them with two radio stations. One would play music from their childhood Backstreet Boys. And the other radio station would play music from their adolescence. So Justin Bieber and Ludacris. And the question is, when they're stressed, did we see people like the mice show a preference for their childhood music? And what we found is that under stress, that's exactly what happened. That people would prefer to tune in to the Backstreet Boys, their childhood music, um, much more than Justin Bieber. Now note, people reported, this isn't about liking, people reported that they liked Justin Bieber and Ludacris better than the Backstreet Boys. But under stress, they started to show this kind of gravitational pull towards their childhood music. Not only that, listening to the childhood music decreased their stress responses physiologically. So, you know, when you're stressed, your palms sweat a little bit, we can measure that. And the childhood music decreased that stress. And we scanned people in the MRI and we found that the childhood music increased activity in the medial prefrontal cortex. So the Backstreet Boys did this to the brain, but Justin Bieber didn't. Um, and it strengthened the connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. And the more that the brain responded to the childhood music, the less anxiety people reported feeling. So you all can think about music that you really liked when you were seven or eight years old. And even though you don't listen, you might not listen to it a lot now, when you're older, maybe you'll remember this talk and you'll remember 
that this can be a good source of anxiety reduction. But at the end of the day, we don't really care about what the Backstreet Boys do to our brains. What we care about are environmental exposures that everybody has, that are species typical. And that is our parents. Our parents are a species expected stimulus. We're born live. We can't take care of ourselves. Somebody's got to take care of us. And we're really interested in what role is the parent playing in shaping the way that the amygdala and prefrontal cortex develop. Now, when I talk about the human, um, lots of animals hang around with their parents. But one thing that is true about the human is that we hang around our parents for a really long time compared to other species. Um, you guys are not parents yet, but um, it's true that it is metabolically very costly to raise another human being. In other words, it's a huge energy suck for a parent to raise another human being for two decades. And so you've got to ask, why would mother nature ever design a species like this? And the reason is because this allows us as humans, as the children, to keep our brains plastic for a really long time. And if our brains are plastic for a really long time, we could do a massive amount of learning. In other words, it's that long period of time with our parents that make our brains so complex, right? If you think about other species like sea turtles, they never even meet their parents. Their brains are not very complex. So you can thank your parents for your complex brains. And we can think about parents as providing kind of a scaffolding, like on the sides of buildings, a scaffolding for the way that our brains develop. Now, this brings us to the literature on attachment. Attachment is something that humans do, and it's something that a lot of, that all mammals do and birds and some um, reptiles. And I wanna just take a second to um, remind us that attachment is actually the survival strategy of the young animal. If you're little, you can't rely on strategies like fight or flight because you can't do either of those very well. Your best strategy, if you're an infant, is to attach to your parent because they're gonna take care of you. And um, here I have lots of examples of different animals that do this, including my daughter. But I also have this picture of Conrad Lorenz. He is clearly not the intended parent of these geese, and yet they are attached to him. And I put that in there because attachments to our parents are learned. We learn to attach to our parents. We don't think about it as learning, but there's a whole learning process there, which is why we can attach to our biological parents or we can attach to our adoptive parents. So we're all biologically predisposed to learn to attach. And our attachment processes define our subsequent cognitive and emotional development. And as I'm about to point out in the next slide, this attachment to our parents is almost obligatory. We attach to our parents regardless of positive or negative experiences. So attachment is not love or liking. Attachment is the glue. It's the following behavior that we exhibit towards our parents. So again, we turn to the rodent literature, which has really beautifully demonstrated this intimate relationship between the parent and amygdala development. This is the work by another colleague named Regina Sullivan, who's at NYU. So briefly, what she's shown is uh, here's a rat pup in a Y maze. If you place the maternal odor at one arm of a Y maze, this rat pup will head towards that maternal odor. That's what I'm showing you here, that you know, almost 100% of the time they're choosing that door. If you took a peppermint odor that the infant um, uh, doesn't care about and you pair it with something nice like a stroke 
and the mother is there while they're learning this, and you place the peppermint odor down here, the animal will still prefer that peppermint odor. It will learn to like Pavlov's associative learning, it will associate a preference for that peppermint odor because its mother was there when it learned about it. Now that makes some intuitive sense, right? Because the stroke is very nice and rewarding. What was shocking about these data is that if you took that peppermint odor and you paired it with something aversive, like a mild foot shock, and the rat pup does not like the foot shock, if it learns that association in the mother's presence, it will still prefer that peppermint odor. It will still head towards that peppermint odor, even though that peppermint odor had been paired with something very negative. In other words, in early development, we learn to prefer any cues that are associated with our parent, whether positive or negative in valence. And the reason this is happening is because of the amygdala. So what I'm showing you here is this is age on the x-axis, rat age. And on the y-axis is how much the amygdala is functional. There's this period early in life when the functioning of the amygdala is completely dependent on whether the mother, I'm saying mother because these are rats, whether the mother is present or absent. When the mother is present in the nest, she keeps stress hormones, cortisol, she keeps stress hormones low, which keeps the amygdala quiet. When the mother is out of the nest, when she's away, stress hormones increase and amygdala activity increases. So the amygdala is essentially turning on or off as a function of whether the mother is physically present. So what that means is back to our behavioral experiment, if you pair a peppermint odor with a foot shock, the mother's not there, most rats would avoid this peppermint odor just like you and I would. And the reason they're avoiding it is, and the reason we would avoid it is because our amygdala supported that learning and the amygdala produces an aversion. So we avoid that peppermint odor. That's what we would expect to happen. However, um, Right, so when the amygdala is on, meaning the mother was away and the amygdala is on, this animal will avoid the peppermint odor. However, if the learning occurred with the mother present, then later on, this rat pup will now prefer that peppermint odor. And that's because the mother's presence turned the amygdala off. And when the amygdala is off, you learn a preference. So if that seems really bizarre to you, then you're following along, right? It's very counterintuitive. But the idea is that for young animals that have to attach, we are obliged to form a preference for anything associated with the parent. And that allows us to follow the parent, regardless of whether it's a nurturing or a maltreating situation. And that's the foundation of our attachment behaviors. So in other words, attachment is a survival strategy of the young animal. Importantly, the parent, in order to have this buffering effect on the amygdala and on cort, cortisol, the stress hormone, in order for this to happen, the parent has to be calm. If the parent herself is distressed or afraid, you will not get this effect. So a calm parent buffers amygdala reactivity. Okay, so I've talked a lot about rats, but what about humans? Well, what I have here is kind of growth charts of uh, humans relative to other species. So if you consider a sea turtle and you look at blue as being evidence of adult characteristics across developmental time, a sea turtle kind of has their basic ingredients. They're born prefab in a way um, from the get-go, which allows them to live independently. Once you get to mammals, 
they start to show this period of developmental plasticity, immaturity, that allows for the caregiver to influence the way the brain is going to develop. And so you get this delay of the adult characteristics in mammals. In humans, as I said earlier, this period of immaturity when we're hanging around our parents a lot is way stretched out. So we don't start showing adult-like characteristics until very late in our development. So maybe that means that even in childhood, past infancy, we can see evidence of parents buffering our stress physiology. So um, to address this question, uh, colleague Megan Gunner at the University of Minnesota administered a public speaking stressor to children. And public speaking, it turns out, is a wonderful way to increase our stress hormones. And we see our cortisol levels increasing in response to public speaking, and children do too. And what she did was she had two groups. She had one group of children that prepared their public speech sitting next to a stranger, and one group who prepared sitting next to their parents. And what she found was when children sat next to a stranger when they prepared, they produce this beautiful elevation in cortisol. But when children prepared sitting next to their parents, the parents blocked that rise in cortisol. So parents were buffering this stress, this physiological stress response in their children. Now, importantly, she repeated this in adolescence. Adolescents did not show this buffering by the parent. They showed this high cortisol reactivity regardless of who they were sitting next to. So it suggests that this effect of the parent is really powerful in childhood, but then the parent may lose some of their efficacy um, with increasing age. We were also interested in this question of parental buffering, but we were interested in the learning component um, that was shown in the rat study by Regina Sullivan. So we paired up with Dr. Sullivan and we did our own conditioning study with uh, three, four and five year olds. So we presented children with a blue square and the blue square was paired with, we didn't use shock, these were little children, but we used a terrible noise, which was like loud nails down a chalkboard. It was very aversive. Blue square always paired with that terrible noise and children learned the purple triangle was paired with nothing. So they learn these associations either alone or with their parents sitting next to them. And so our question was, do children act the same way as rat pups in showing this paradoxical approach for the blue square if it was learned in their parents' presence? So this is a human fear conditioning paradigm. Okay, I'm gonna skip that for the sake of time. So we made a human Y maze for little children and this was a play tent where children entered and they saw that nasty blue square on one arm and the triangle on the other. And we asked children to go into the tent and pick a door to retrieve a prize. And we showed them it was the same bucket of toys behind both doors, but we just wanted them to pick whatever door they wanted. And the question was just like the rat pups, would we see that learning these associations in your parents' presence didn't result in avoiding that blue square, but instead resulted in preferring that blue square. And that's exactly what we found. When children learned on their own, they did what you and I would do and they avoided that nasty blue square. But when children learn the associations in the presence of their parents, they did what the rat pups did they started showing a behavioral preference towards that blue square because it was associated with their parents. And so here I'm just showing you the data. These are the same children. They, when they learned uh, the association alone, they avoided that nasty blue square. And when those same children learned in the presence of their parents, they preferred that blue square. And that was true for three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and five-year-olds. Okay. 
And we also, you know, the rodent study suggested that this effect of the parent was happening because parents were buffering amygdala reactivity. So we looked at um, our data from the fMRI when we presented children now, not with fear faces, but with pictures of their own parents. And what we found was pictures of parents, when children looked at pictures of their parents, their amygdala activity decreased very much looking like the buffering that we saw in the rat pups. In adolescents, we did not see that parental buffering effect, again, suggesting that this effect is strongest in childhood. So it may be that in both rodents and in humans, during childhood, parents are effective buffers of amygdala reactivity, and that changes our learning behaviors so that we form preferences for things associated with our parents. Now, everything I said depends on the parent being calm, but we know parents aren't always calm and parents don't always have the luxury of being calm. Um, many parents live under very stressful circumstances. And so we did this separate experiment where we investigated whether parents could if they're really good at dampening fear, are they also the best ones to exacerbate fear? So here we're looking at parental transmission of fears. So instead of doing fear conditioning with children, we instead fear condition the parents. So this is me getting fear conditioned to this circle, every time I heard, saw this circle, I would hear that horrible noise and I would flinch. So we recorded this and then we would show this video to my daughter. So she never got fear conditioned herself, but she saw me get fear conditioned to this um, circle. And she would watch somebody else's parent get fear conditioned to a different stimulus. Later, we would then present her with these two stimuli and assess how well she learned. Did she learn better from me? to fear stimulus or was it equal across both um, models? And what we find is in the amygdala, the, um, my, my daughter's amygdala was more reactive to the stimulus that I had learned about. So the pink circle that I had learned was terrible. That same pink circle was more effective in increasing activity in my daughter's amygdala than what was the nasty green square that somebody else's parent had learned about. And although my someone like my daughter could learn to dislike both stimuli, they learn better from their parents to dislike that nasty stimulus. So in other words, parents are really good at, calm parents are really good at regulating this negative emotion, but parents are probably the best ones who also can amplify these negative emotions during childhood. So taken together, um, what we think is going on looks like this, and I'm almost at the end of my talk. If this is age on the x-axis here, we think that there's this potential sensitive period during childhood when parents can influence or have a really big influence on this emotion regulation neurobiology, whereby parents are both increasing as well as decreasing these behaviors in neurobiology. And perhaps parents have some kind of privileged pathway into children's brain development. And um, the idea is that once that sensitive period closes and we transition into adolescence, that the individual differences we see in subsequent emotionality in adolescence and adulthood reflects the learning that happened during this sensitive period in childhood. So to conclude, I've said that um, the human amygdala medial prefrontal cortex circuitry develops really slowly, but perhaps there's value in that slow development, in that slow cooking, so to speak. That gives us a really long time as humans to learn about emotions, to develop our emotional responding, our emotional repertoire, both at the behavior and the brain level. And we start to see the transition to the adult-like brain state at the start of adolescence. 
And finally, I've emphasized parents a lot. Certainly parents aren't the only important adults or important social influence on our brains. But I think it's fair to say that parents are a really big influence on the way that our brains develop. And so parents may be a primary social or external regulator of what's happening in the brain, being uh, having some sort of privileged uh, access to those emotional learning centers. So with that, I'm just uh, acknowledging up here our funding sources, members of the lab, uh, thanking the families and individuals that participated and thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions.